This week on the Movement RBA Podcast, we talk to British Olympian Andrew Steele of DNA Fits, and all of the mysteries of our bodies are revealed to us. We have formed a super tribe with Koyos. What is Koyos? Koyos is a nootropic that enhances cognitive function. That means if you use your brain to make money, or you use your brain in general, Koyos will help you use it more effectively. I use Koyos, Jake uses Koyos, lots of people at CrossFit RVA use Koyos. And we now have a uh, sponsorship with them where you get 25% off if you use the code RVA when you go to purchase at their website. That is RVA. So go to www.mentaltitan.com, purchase your Koyos today, use our code, get 25% off. I don't like doing this that much, but if you like the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you think we're really awesome, go to iTunes, give us a review. Five stars is the best we can get. We're honestly happy with anything that happens. So do it, do it now, and enjoy the show. Welcome back, everyone, to the Movement RVA podcast. I am Matt Criccio, and beside me is my uh, long-haired friend, Jake Rao. Hello again. We are joined by Andrew Steele, who works at DNA Fit and is also a Olympic athlete uh, from Great Britain. What's up, Andrew? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to talking you through your genetic profiles. Yeah, and thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, so some of you may remember from previous episode we got a dna test from dna fit and um we have our results and andrew's here to explain to us what they mean but first uh andrew why don't you tell everyone a little bit about who you are and how you came to work for dna fit and what your background is sure sure so thanks um so much for for having me um I guess to, to put this in perspective, um, I always like to tell people a little bit about my story as an Olympic athlete, learning what worked for me and crucially what didn't work for me um, and what role perhaps my genetics played in this, in learning this. Um, and that's one of the very strong reasons why I came to be you know, one of the founding members of this company uh, is actually using the technology for myself in my career as a 400 meter runner um, on track and field. So. Um, if anybody out there has ever tried to run the 400 meters, um, they might know it's uh, a particularly unique demand on the body. Um, it's a it's a sprint event officially, but it's a very very long sprint. It's a whole lap of the track, more or less flat out. Uh, so it requires quite a unique demand in terms of the energy systems that the body uses. You need everything from being a world-class short sprinter to having great aerobic endurance, great lactic acid tolerance, great muscular strength and speed. You need every every part of the spectrum, really. Uh, even though it's officially a sprint event, it requires all, everything the body's got. So um, how to, you know be the best 400-meter runner you can be in track and field um, is always a finding the right balance between sprint and endurance training and as you guys will know from the work you do um, at CrossFit there is that you know actually you guys span a wide range of physiological needs Absolutely. wide range of physical but you know you guys deliberately go about being as good as you can be at everything there is to be good at so so um, it's quite an appropriate kind of although our, my my event seems so specific um, the the needs of how I'm training my body I think are really quite appropriate to um, how you guys might you know, use um, the same mentality to make yourselves the best you can be at what you guys are doing um, so I, I'll just tell you very quickly my story really um, so I'm a 400 meter runner and have been professionally now for about 11 years uh, and I've had some the highest point in my career thus far came at the Beijing Olympic Games in 2008 Actually, seven years ago now, which is crazy <laughs> how many years have passed. But, but hey, we keep, we keep pushing on. Um, and I'll probably keep pushing on until um, Rio 2016 next year. And then I'll probably hang up the spikes once I've hopefully been successful at the Rio Olympic Games and uh, finally, you know, 
maybe have a little rest for a little bit. So, um, and the high point of my career came in 2008, and and. After that, I had a particularly low point in my career over the following four years, actually in the run-up to the London 2012 Olympic Games, the home Olympic Games. Unfortunately, I made some mistakes there in my training um, and, and was actually unsuccessful in making the team at my home Olympic Games. So, to put it in perspective, um, in the run-up to the Beijing Olympic Games in 2008, I used to train for the 400 meters in a somewhat unorthodox manner. <laughs> so I used to train with a coach that was known to do a lot of distance work, a lot of endurance work, and not much sprint work. Um, so we used to do almost train like we were middle distance athletes, you know, 800 meter runners or 1500 meter runners. We do a lot of mileage, measure our resting heart rate, not do much of the short acceleration sprint training. And this was generally considered the, in inverted commas, in quotations, the wrong way to train for elite 400 meter running. But evidently it was quite effective for me. Um, I reached the Olympic Games as my my first attempt to do so. And quick uh, question, to, um, go ahead. just for perspective for our members, because we're going to, uh, you know, we do uh, you know some 400s just uh, as part of our training. What is uh, what kind of time does it take to qualify for the uh, the Olympic team? Good question. Ah, yeah, very good question. So um, the qualification, it normally takes around somewhere in the middle 45 seconds, so yeah. about 45 five seconds, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure, have, you, have either of you guys got a got a 400 meter PR that you can... I think uh, mine's <laughs> maybe around like a minute and five seconds. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> where mine is. Oh. It's a brutal event, guys, brutal, you know. <laughs> so... But my my PR is um is is forty four point nine four seconds. Um, so anything under forty five seconds is you know generally considered world class. Um, and actually, I made that breakthrough. I broke that forty five second barrier for the first time at the Beijing Olympic Games. So um, it was a pretty successful Olympic Games for me. I made the semi final, ran forty four seconds, and in the four by four hundred meter relay, of course, which as a four hundred meter runner we always take part in. Um, we actually came fourth in the final, 0.3 of a second outside wow. of the medal. So, uh, crucially, the US won, obviously. <laughs> These guys always destroy us at the 4x400. Um, so, we ran really fast, actually, in a time that would have won us silver in every other Olympic Games in history. Oh, wow. But at this particular Olympic Games, these guys just turned it up. So, <laughs> so we're sorry so about we that. Missed out, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, so, okay, I'll let you off. I'll let you off. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, so, look, we, uh, it was a good Olympic Games. It was great as, as a young athlete, kind of my first Olympic Games experience. I had some really good takeaways. I also had the disappointment of being so close to a medal but not getting the medal itself. But either way, um, so it was all very positive. And we had to sit down after Beijing, and in you know, in in the general fitness world, you, it kind of seems funny, but we plan in four years, you know, in elite sport, we work right. on a four-year plan. Um, so it's a long-term goal, and we had four years to the home Olympic Games, guys. Like the 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 chances of being alive when we're hosting Olympic Games are so small anyway to be a competitive Olympic athlete already of a, that sort of level this London 2012 Olympic Games was such a big goal yeah great so opportunity too big you know so um, so basically we had to sit down and plan how do we get you to be about half a second quicker over the next four years <laughs> seems simple right you know <laughs> just just half a second the amount of time it takes you to click your fingers I had to improve over 400 meters over four years so we looked at my strengths and my weaknesses and everything I did in training and along with my coach, my physio, my nutritionist, uh, the guys that paid my bills crucially as well at the federation and sponsors, um, we said, right, in order to get half a second quicker, your weakest part is your short sprint ability. So when you drive out of the blocks up to about 50 to 100 meters, these guys are running away from you. I'm catching them in the end because of all that endurance training I did, but I was not as good as them at the first part. So we said, if you can just get as good as these guys at the first part of the race, you're going to get half a second for free. 
Um, so we said, all right, and I like the sound of it. It sounded like more glamorous type of training method. Um, you know, it didn't have as much of that horrible endurance stuff in. It had more of the glamorous short sprint stuff. Um, and we said, yeah, let's let's go for it. For four years, we made this shift, change in emphasis to be as good as these guys at the short part of the race, rather than just be better than them at the long part. If that makes sense. So, um, so we tried that um, and. Crucially, it didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, so, four years later, on the day of selection for London 2012, I was seventh in the country, and they take the top six. Wow! Four years prior, in 2008, I was number one in the country. Right. So, so I was definitely in. <laughs> yeah. So for the past four years, um, just kind of so we have an understanding, that was training was your full time job. Is is that correct? Yeah. So. Um, so training the training methods, I do the endurance with some sprint in the run up to Beijing, so 2004 to 2008, and then from Beijing 2008 to London 2012, uh, we use the sprint method with some endurance training as opposed to the other way around. Right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And so, but that was um. But training was your only goal. You you didn't you have were, a job outside of right. that. Yeah. You were a professional athlete, correct? Oh no, yeah, for sure. No, professional athlete, yeah. So, um, you know, this was before DNA Fit. Um, so I was just busy going to training and then, you know, enjoying a coffee in the afternoon. You know, no entrepreneurial endeavor to distract me. <laughs> but, um, but effectively, yeah. So just full time, full time training. Yeah. So we train six days a week, uh, twice a day generally, um, and we work on everything from you know we're in the gym doing our Olympic lift. We outside doing plyometrics. We're doing 5K road races. You know, we do a whole range of activity, which I'm sure you know your guys would probably destroy me at generally in, in general training. But I probably have the upper hand when it came to running one lap. On I would track. imagine so. Yeah. Pretty, pretty safe to say. <laughs> and so, and I know this is sort of a little outside of what we're talking about directly. But what is so? What's that margin of um, a really good day or a really bad day in the 400 for you? Are we saying half a second or a second is really that's the difference yeah. right there. Yeah, the margin is super small. So, you know, I can, to put it in perspective, for the London 2012 selection, I was one hundredth of a second away from making the team. Wow. So, so one hundredth of it, you can't even click your fingers that quick. You can't start and start, stop a stopwatch that quickly, you know? Like, that's that challenge, you wow. know? So, so, so I was a stupidly small margin away from making the Home Olympic Games. But, you know, really, over those four years, I got on average about a second slower than I'd been running in Beijing. So hmm. uh, I, I narrowly missed out, but had I maintained or got better from the athlete I was in 2008, I would have been in, no question. So, um, so I learned the hard way what worked for me and what didn't work for me. Um, and hey, there was there was two other bits that went wrong in that, those four years, which I, I will touch upon quickly. Uh, I ruptured my Achilles tendon, uh, which doesn't help, of course. And then I also um, had mono mono mononucleosis, as you guys call it, I think, uh, or glandular fever, as we refer to it here in the UK. Hmm. And um, and that didn't didn't help me either in the run up. So, you know, I had this kind of bad experience over four years and I missed out on the home Olympic Games. So it's very, very unfortunate, very, very upsetting as an athlete because I'd worked towards that for seven years. So after after the dust had settled, after I'd dealt with this like blow almost, I said to myself, right, we've got another four years ahead. What went wrong there and what can I do to fix it? Uh, and I made the decision that I was going to go back to the old way of training, the old endurance majority with some sprint rather than trying to beat these guys at their own game I was just going to make my game so strong that they couldn't beat me at all in the last hundred so I was going to continue to go back to playing to my strengths rather than just working on my weaknesses um, and shortly after I got sent to swab just as you guys will have done uh, it wasn't called DNA Fit it wasn't a brand it wasn't a company at the time uh, and a scientist basically was just looking for some feedback from athletes sports people on what the test meant to them and how they it fitted with their experience, etc. So I did this test and I thought, with some cynicism, I must say, to start with, I was a little bit cynical because I've been fed sort of lab tests and measurements all my career, and a lot of the time I felt it overcomplicated matters. I just wanted to get out, out and run, you know. Um, 
but when I got my results, I was quite astounded, actually, um, on how well they fitted with what I've been forced to learn through that painful trial and error. Um, so without going into too much detail, we'll probably wait till we get to you guys' reports. Um, but I really saw how this could, I wish I had have had this information four years previously to influence the decision making of what type of training I did to reach my goal. And if I'd had it, I think it would have been a very powerful influencer. It wouldn't have changed everything, but it would have been that extra piece of evidence I needed to perhaps keep playing to my strengths rather than playing to the other, my competitors' strengths, as it were. What's really interesting, um, and you said it before, is CrossFit is a big experiment in trying to be the best you can at everything. So me and Jake, before we actually did this, were talking about how we would likely um, know already, or the test would confirm what we already thought about ourselves, especially when it came to the power and endurance response, mm -hmm. because we test so many different things that if you've been doing CrossFit for years like we have, you know what things you're good at and what things are weaknesses. So I think that um, if we wanna get into the results, especially the power and endurance part, mine fell yeah. exactly where I thought it would. Um, okay. <laughs> and Jake actually predicted his pretty accurately too. Yeah, I mean the. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting to see, you know, like the balance. But you know, we we did call it both of us pretty, you know, correctly in terms of which way it would lean to. Um, I mean, personally, uh, I have always felt that uh, my my effectiveness from uh, I guess what I get out of training on the conditioning side of things has always been fairly low. Um, I feel like I have to put in a huge effort to really get much back when, um, you know, I'll be, the, the people next to me seem like they can um, run less or row less. Yeah, I hate or, those guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah I hate and it's, um, and just, uh, you know, make more progress more quickly. Um, on the other side of things though, um, you know, while I am certainly no great athlete, I could tell that on the power and strength side of things, the, the adaptations seem to come a, a little more quickly. Um, I, I certainly felt more comfortable moving quickly for a short period of time rather than moving kind of fast for a very long period of time. So for me, um, the power and endurance ratio is, it was 65 power to uh, about 35 endurance, which, which I feel like re reflects that pretty well. Okay, good. Well, yeah. So let's talk. Let's talk about the power endurance response, so your listeners understand what we what we're really talking about here. You know. Um, so first and foremost, people need to remember genetics is not reactive to what you currently do. So um, if you uh, you might say, well, yeah, I've been doing lots of power work, so um, but the test doesn't show I'm a power responder. Our genes don't know or care what we currently do. They actually just they tell us what we are from the start, pre-training, pre-environment, everything, what we are genetic. So we, we could test you guys now, and in 20 years, you'd have exactly the same results. Our genes never change, this is non-reactive, it's static. So that's part of its power, really. Um, and now, when you've been gone down this fitness road, like you two guys have, uh, you, you start to learn a little bit about what works for you, what works for others, what doesn't work for you and vice versa. That's because we all know it. When we train in a group, we all do get better, but some get better at certain parts of that training quicker than others and others you know, may get better at the other part of the training, um, as you guys' experience has, has attested to. And part of that reason is uh, our environment, it might be our training history, it might be what we enjoy, but also part of it is how we're genetically made. And it doesn't change the whole uh, picture, but it is one extra parameter that so far we've been blind to. You know, the world has been blind to measuring this. We've just said, okay, yeah, well, I've always done this, so I'm, I'm quite good at that right now, so I'm going to try that. But we've never taken into account how we're made from a genetic point of view. And that's all we're trying to do is identify that so we're no longer blind to the DNA uh, results that we have that may affect our exercise response. So we look at this panel of genes. Um, that are the most researched genes out there. And this is crucial because we look at things called SNPs, guys, which are SNP, and that actually stands for the long name, which you don't have to remember, which is the single nucleotide polymorphism. So, um, but they, these are basically locations on our genes which can change the makers individual. So SNPs, the kind of SNP you have affects whether you've got 
different coloured eyes to the next person or curlier hair than the next person and they also affect on to different nutritional or fitness interventions so um, these SNPs we look at are the most researched known out there around their role in training response so some people with certain versions of genes respond better to a certain kind of training than other people with other versions of genes and that's what we look at we take all these SNPs we put them into our algorithm which ends up giving us a percentage score um, of power or endurance response. It doesn't mean what you can or can't be good at, it's just the training methods we use, uh, how well you are likely to be a high responder or low responder to those type of training methods. So we don't change your goal. This is really crucial that people understand. In genetics, is not about predeterminism. We're not trying to change somebody's goal based on genetics, we're rather just trying to change how they reach that goal most efficiently for them, whatever the goal may be. So where did you break down on the power endurance response? So I was around 65% endurance response um, in endurance's favor. So, um, so really crucial for me. That was the first thing which got me in there. And I was like, hey, so you're telling me I've got a majority of endurance response genetics. And I found out over eight painful years, that four, <laughs> four years of them spent doing an endurance majority uh, training, that I got better quicker that way. Um, and that there's one really key gene in there, guys, which we should probably just uh, like let people know around. It's a gene called the ACTN3 gene. And um, that comes in our power endurance panel. And this gene is almost like an A-list gene, if there's such a thing. This is like the most researched gene around uh, sort of sporting performance almost. And this gene, you can have three versions of it. You can have CC. Uh, CT or TT. So you have two copies of the C version of the gene, two copies of the T version of the gene, or one of each. And what you have depends on what you've inherited from your mother and father. So if you've got one of each, C and T, you've inherited a C from one parent and a T from another. Uh, so in this gene, the C version is known to be the, in inverted commas, the power version of that gene. So those with the C version can really efficiently build fast twitch muscle fiber. Um, so if you've got that C version, doing higher intensity uh, power type um, rep structures, so maybe like eight sets of two on your lifts or you know six sets of three rather than the high rep number sets, um, then you're going to be almost building this fast twitch muscle fiber hypertrophy quicker than someone without that gene. Um, and so I didn't have that gene. I had the TT version. So all that short acceleration stuff that I was doing, I was getting better at, but at a rate that was so drastically less than someone else with the CC version of that gene. Got it. That it was almost like I may as well just, you know, keep it in there, but not try and beat them at their own game. Yeah, and Jake actually has the CC version. Oh yeah, yeah. right, good. Yeah, 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 good. So, so yeah, so Jake's got the CC, and uh, and what have you got, Matt? So you got the. Uh, Oh, now there's one CC here, and then let's have a look. We, and then we've got a oh, both of you, both of you got the CC. Really? We're just natural yeah, athletes. We've we just yeah, you're both. We so missed out the, on our calling. Why am I so bad at CrossFit then? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so the the CC version actually is um I mean having the CC version doesn't mean you can't be good at something which isn't a power event. You understand? So we don't take one gene in isolation in the results we give you at all. It's just an interesting one to point out. So um, you uh, you have the CC version, but then you may also have some of the other genes which are known for their big endurance response. And that's why we give a percentage at the end rather than absolute. Right, because... So we talk about... Go ahead, go I'm ahead. sorry. Yeah. So, so we talk about you know how to point yourself within the parameters, within the spectrum of the training you need to do anyway for your goal, um, how to take this information on board. So we, if we get, we, we've had, for example, we have an Olympic marathon runner who had an ever so slight power majority. He had about 55, 57% power response, I think. And you'd say, oh, that's counterintuitive. He's an endurance athlete. But actually, it's just rather saying, no, we don't mean that you can't be a marathon runner, or you can't be a sprinter. But the way you train to be that should be influenced by what you have in terms of these genes. So that's the, that's the important point. So there's no gene that tells you you can or can't do anything uh, at all. Right. Um, but it, yeah. Because I got the CC, yet on the, in the algorithm, my endurance percentage is much higher than my power uh, percentage. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. So, so you've got the CC. So if we just read your CC, we'd say, oh, you should be a sprinter or you should be a power lifter. There's no way it's but true. <laughs> if we didn't, if we didn't take into it, if we didn't take into account all the other genes that we know about, then uh, we would make that assumption, and that would be a flawed assumption because we'd be ignoring. If you look on your endurance table there, um, you've got a whole bunch of these endurance versions of those genes. So uh, there's like one, two, three, four, five. There's six of the genes with the very strong effect on the algorithm. So that's why you end up as an endurance majority. So you've got more of the genes we know that have an endurance response role than the power response role. Right. Uh, so we have to look at the whole picture and give an action point based on the whole picture, not just a single gene uh, on its own, because that could be misleading. Yeah, because I can see, like, so for me, for the endurance genes, I only have three of those listed that are under the, the CC result, which, again, so I guess that's, that's why right, yeah. that's why Matt is weighting a little more heavily yeah, towards yeah. So the endurance Yeah, so what we do with this algorithm is it's quite complicated behind it, but effectively the heavier the research behind that gene's activity the heavier it weighs on the end algorithm so um, so if you know if a gene is like the ACTN3 gene is very 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 heavily researched around its role in power response so if you've got that version of that gene um, that will play a certain role in in your entire end percentage but the other versions of the genes when cumulatively put together might might balance that out or they might not depending on what you have so you cannot look at one gene in, uh, alone uh, it would, could be a very misleading result because we could tell you oh you've got the cc version of the actn3 gene therefore you're a sprinter you've also got the gg version of the ppara gene which is a strong endurance response gene therefore you should also be an endurance it doesn't mean anything so we have to know how they work together and what the cumulative effect of those genes is in order to give um reasonable and actionable environment change advice right me and Jake are both, um, we had a healthy debate about this at one point, and uh, uh, according to the test, we have a uh, very high, I guess, potential VO2 max response. And um, so, Yeah, that's right, yeah. We were talking about on uh, some podcasts about how that's largely determined from birth. So uh, it's so, funny yeah. because I would never have guessed that that was the case. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. So, so what we what I can see here is that um, we, what we have is basically it's almost a measure of VO2 max trainability. Um, so it's not necessarily about what you can be, but some are higher responders to increasing their VO2 max. Than, have you had your VO2 max measured, guys, at all? I, I never have. No, I don't no. think Jake has either. I have not either. No. So so what we what we find is that. When they say VO2 max is somewhat determined from birth, what they actually mean is your uh, um, response to increasing your VO2 max is affected from birth, and that means your genetics. So some people with certain gene variants are higher responders. When they train their VO2 max system, so when if their goal is to improve their endurance and they are measuring VO2 max as one of those KPIs, um, if you're a high responder, in the same time period of training, if you both started at the same uh, sort of fitness level, a low responder will see a lower result after the same time period than a higher responder. It doesn't mean the low responder won't reach the highest levels, but they are their trainability is ever so slightly lower, so it's going to take them longer, basically. So, um, so one of you is a very high responder, one of you is a high responder, um, and so you would probably imagine that if you both did exactly the same endurance training, both measured your VO2 max at the start of a training plan and then at the end of a 12-week training plan, um, and you both started on the same level of VO2 max sort of fitness, then uh, the very high responder amongst you is going to see a better increased VO2 max within the same time period versus the, the one that's a slightly lower responder. Cool. So it's a measure of trainability, is how I like to communicate. Yeah. It. Does that does that clear up what we what we mean by that, Mark? No, that totally makes sense to me. That makes sense, and I think it's it's important when people look at this that again, it's telling us uh, again not not what we can be good at, but certainly um, more or less how to reach that specific goal and, and sort of the method. So I I could see some people for this like um, uh, I mean being very easy to sort of uh, overthink or maybe even obsess over these results in terms of determining what your goals should be. I mean, do you see that with people? I mean, do you see some people get their results and say, well, 
clearly I need to be doing something different or my goal should be different <laughs> or, you know, like maybe, maybe I should go from being a, uh, you know, uh, weekend warrior 5k runner to uh, a power lifter, you know, just cause my genetics said something a little different. Um, what, what, what well, sort of response do you guys get from people when they get their results? So it very much depends on the cut on the all the existing, um, let's say advancement level of the customer so if you are and what you know, the, the the audience that we're sort of talking to now are going to be somewhat down the road of understanding their own health and fitness you know they they've been passionate about getting fit they've done some training they've maybe tried some other exercise then they've, they've landed in CrossFit you know um, and generally with those guys it's not a problem at all so people understand yeah I've seen that that guy in my group training he got so good at this power lifting but I can't but I'm better than him at the the wads which involve you know more, more endurance um, and so with those that are a little bit more advanced and we work in a professional sport and even in the military as well um, and of course that those guys we don't have any risk of them misinterpreting it but with someone that's quite early in their health and fitness what we make sure we've got to be so clear in in communicating it is that this is one aspect one measure of the whole picture um, but your environment matters just as much so in in the kind of meta analysis of the studies of the roles of genetics and environment in fitness they end up being about 50 50 so um, what we provide here, and this is quite important actually, is that we only provide pieces of information that have a clear, actionable environment or lifestyle change that will completely support or cancel out that difference in the gene. So um, we don't tell you anything you can't do anything about, for example. So someone who's a lower responder to VO2 max, okay, genetically they are, have a slightly, they need a longer time to reach the same level. It doesn't mean they can't reach the level, um, but rather they should know this so they can plan their training accordingly. So it's just about communicating it the right way. I think because of like, pop culture, maybe like in movies, in, in books, people have talked about genetics as predeterminism and it's really not. It's just about knowing a bit more about you and how you respond so you can build your training effectively. we really got to be careful that people don't take this the wrong way and say, oh, maybe I shouldn't bother trying to be this. What's more important is what you want to be, what your goal is, and then we can tailor the training that you do towards that goal with the genetics in mind. Yeah, I think a marker that people could easily mistake is the injury risk and recovery speed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Markers. Yeah, I got to say the uh, of all the things, you know, looking over our results and even discussing a little bit, uh, you know, what we're going to get back. You know, before we got our results, uh, I'll say that the injury risk was the one thing that I was very, I was curious about the most, and I was, I think, the most skeptical about. Um, a lot of the other things made a lot of sense to me in terms of how that would be largely genetically determined or have a large role. But, you know, at least in the gym and, you know, working with the people we do here at CrossFit RVA, um, you know, so much of, I think, the injury risk potential we run into is, is largely lifestyle based. So it's mm. the people, uh, you know, it's going to be a... Uh, lack of sleep, a, uh, you know, even posture, you know, are you sitting at a desk for eight hours a day or 10 hours a day or driving all day? Um, you know, things like that building up over time, I see at least are the, the immediate causes of injury, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm curious is what is, um, what are we really looking at at this injury risk profile? Cause I see me and Matt are basically on death's door right now. Like, uh, if we, I'm waiting for my body to snap up immediately. You know, if I wake up and just step out of bed the wrong way, my Achilles is going, you know? So what, yeah, so yeah, what yeah. are we looking at? Like, what, what does this mean for us? Okay, great. So risk is, is the word which kind of gets people's backs up, you know? So, um, what I like to refer to it more as is almost like a predisposition. And we're focused specifically here on connective tissue. So, um, the genes are really around, tendons, ligaments, joints, rather than, <laughs> let's say, you know, um, the risk of you falling over when, when, when you're going to... So, so Matt and I have just particular. thin, wispy yeah. ligaments, just like spider yeah. webs. Like dental floss. Yeah, dental floss holding our, our yeah, yeah. You, bones you, together. I wouldn't go so far as that, but you've got a <laughs> bigger... One of you um, in particular with the TT version of the Col 5A1. Whose report is that that I'm on here? Uh, so we're the, looking... Here, let me if you're on the... Um, probably me. One, um, so, 
Cole five oh one TT. Let me just pull up to the right page and see uh, whose report I'm in the middle. That's Matt. Yeah. So we're so, looking at the overview. So we got to scroll down to that recovery. Yeah, that's page twelve. Yeah. And uh, now we're on it. Okay. So what is uh what does the two stars mean for the TT? Oh yeah. Okay. TT yeah. Cole five A one. That's that's me by the way. Okay. So yeah, that's you. You, Matt, yeah, so, so, um, Matt, so don't the, you have like the, a the cold... sprained ankle right now? Yeah, I, I hurt myself all the time. <laughs> right, a, how many bones have you broken? Incidents. Yeah, yeah. So, look, the way I like to communicate this is um, crossing a road is not that high risk in itself, but should you close your eyes before crossing the road, you increase the probability of something going wrong. <laughs> so, um, so you decide to close your eyes and just walk blindly into the road, the chances of something going wrong become a little bit higher. Um, when you open your eyes, you have the opportunity to decide whether it's safe to cross the road or not. Um, and what we look at here in injury risk is um, how these genes might interact with our environment uh, where the raised predisposition. So if you have a raised predisposition to Achilles tendon um, tendinopathy, let's say, and both of you do, but Matt has the even slightly higher raised, uh, particularly from the Col 5A1 gene he has there, um, then... I, I hate my parents right now. I'm calling you bubble, <laughs> bubble Boy from now on. So look, you could have the very highest injury risk possible, but if all you did every day was sit in a nice warm jacuzzi, you're probably not going to get injured. No, it makes sense because <laughs> w when I was in the military, I got hurt all the time. So really, that yeah. would be when I was doing high-risk activities. I was, I was yes. the guy that got hurt every single time. So and, and vice versa, if you have you might have the lowest on our scale of injury risk here, but if all you're doing every day is single leg plyometric bounds in bare feet on concrete, you're gonna be pretty likely of rupturing your Achilles tendon. Right. So how did um, you uh, so, if you don't mind me asking, how did you uh, rupture your Achilles? <laughs> well, I ruptured my Achilles tendon actually filming a children's television show for the BBC here. See that's in the a UK. that's a great story. I don't know. <laughs> now, why didn't you tell us that before? <laughs> <laughs> it was I was running during it, thankfully. Um, so, uh, but it actually, yeah, and you know, lo and behold, I have that TT version of the Col 5A1 and the GG version of the Col 1A1, which are the, both the ones specifically uh, have been shown to increase risk of Achilles tendinopathy and Achilles tendon problems. So, you know, I had no surprise in learning that I had a higher risk of Achilles, uh, but I'd had to rupture that. In Achilles to find that out previously, I would rather just have looked at the stars on my DNA fit gene table to know whether I was the higher risk than you know, rupture my Achilles to find out. Yeah, it's also it's interesting the CrossFit community. Um, you know, there's a few sort of trademark injuries that uh, we have accumulated over the years as a uh, a very large community here, um, and one of those is the Achilles rupture. Um, most often we see that through uh, rebounding, rebounding uh, high rep box jumps, which is, is yes. really no surprise, but, you know, so I guess the question is... Um, but some I, people don't get injured, crucially doing it also, you of know? Of course, so yeah. There's, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference there. Yeah, yeah so some yeah. people it, it certainly happens to. Um, some people it does not. Uh, it, it, you know, it happens often enough, and I think there's enough risk there that um, in, at least in our gym, we do not do the the rebound um, because it found that just sort of the the risk is too too high for general population and, and maybe there's some uh, people who have more of a competitive um, goal for their training and so they might you know sort of understand that risk and, and take it upon themselves to do rebounding box jumps just because it's faster but um, it's uh, you know I, I, we, of course we don't have the data but I would be interested to see for, for all the people who um, have ruptured their Achilles. I wonder if they do share the uh, you know s similar disposition, like the same sort of genetic results here that we're looking at for uh, like Matt or yourself. That's right. It's important actually to note that having the higher risk doesn't mean that you can't do the thing. So all we do is then add in more of the preventative, prehabilitative work around Achilles. Um, so you're uh, actually you know real strong. Um, evidence for reducing Achilles tendon uh, rupture risk with um, not just eccentric loading on the calves, but actually isometric loading. Hmm. So um, that's the the you know the holds under quite heavy weight, uh, which we would do. We place more priority on for those that are high risk as a preventative measure, even if they're asymptomatic, even if they're not in pain currently. Um, but they should be looking to do some extra careful 
strengthening work around the higher risk areas just because they know they are at a higher predisposition. So, you know, just because I've got a higher risk doesn't mean I'm going to stop sprinting, but rather when I do my strength and conditioning training, I'm going to know that even if I'm not in pain, I'm going to look after my my isometric loading on my Achilles anyway just to lessen that risk that I've got raised via my genetic profile. And, and you're probably so not going to film any more uh, children's shows. So, <laughs> Or if I do, I'm going to go through a serious <laughs> isometric loading phase. In the a, a lot of prehab before that. Yeah, yeah. a lot of prehab for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the injury risk. Guys. It's about what you can do in your environment to manipulate that injury risk with your genetics in mind. Now the recovery speed is that kind of that's the same. You're testing that in the same manner in which it's a probability of that, correct? That's right. Yeah. So what we look at here are a bunch of SNPs which are associated with pro-inflammatory or normal inflammatory response to exercise. So, as we all know, uh, and as your listeners will know, when we exercise very hard, we kind of create this micro-inflammatory response. You know, our, our body effectively creates this inflammation and that's a good thing and in clearing this inflammation is how the body gets better how it adapts to training stimuli so um, we don't want to get rid of this inflammation unnecessarily so you might have re- come across the you know there was kind of a trend to, to try and do an ice bath after every training session in the past and then people realized that that was actually stunting training adaptation because you were artificially shutting down the inflammatory response when actually you need that to get better <laughs> so so um so some people create more inflammation than the next based on their genetics so those that are very fast recoverers here have the versions of the gene which uh, are the the least inflammatory response and those that are very slow have the most inflammatory response so i can see a medium here uh, for maths i think and then jake's the same uh, jake's the same oh, boring. middle of the road the middle of the road <laughs> So what um so, what would you then as an athlete, a uh, longtime athlete, what uh, I mean, what would you suggest for uh, you know what would be your prescription for someone who has that like you say a very uh, slow recovery speed here that that large inflammatory response? So we use this to build the training week or two week schedule rather than we don't use this to build like um, recoveries. Be- between exercises oh, okay. or recoveries between reps and um, the, the micro cycle stuff we don't know we do know how to use this on a meso cycle level so um, let's say you've got a you know a week of training planned and you're planning to go hard Monday Wednesday Thursday Saturday for example or something like that you know or Monday Wednesday Friday Saturday um, those that are very fast, you know, faster recoverers, that might be fine um, because they're creating less inflammation for the back-to-back days at the end of the week. Um, but those that are slow recoverers, we might warn against doing back-to-back very hard similar stress days just because not only are you going to increase the risk of burnout by having too much of this cumulative inflammatory response, but secondly because they're not going to see the adaptation they want. So they're not going to get what they want as much out of that training because they're not allowing their body time to clear this inflammatory response after the hard exercise. So it's just about tailoring when you put in a lower intensity day um, in the week or two week cycle, even the month cycle that you work on, to make sure that you take this into account as well as your other markers for recovery, how well you feel, did you eat well enough, did, is your heart rate variability different. So there's a few little tricks you can do to make sure that when you train hard, you're ready to train hard, and when you're not ready to train hard, that you do the right stuff to support that hard training that you have done. And of course, in the, uh, you know, being in this group class environment and seeing a, a huge range of sort of athletic abilities, um, you know, we can see this, I mean, very clearly, we can see the people who can um, come in and train for, you know, two plus hours a day, five days a week, and never run into any issue whatsoever. I know. And, and then I we have them. the really people. I hate them too. <laughs> then we have the people who, um, you know, come in three days a week. And if they train any more than that, that's when they start running into issues. Um, it, at the same time, doesn't mean that both of those people, I, I think, as we've been saying so far, can't make progress, but just need to be sort of aware of what their training no, they just look need like. to better pick their battles you know and then look i'm a very slow on this panel like the the slowest you can be so when i train i'm creating much more of this inflammatory response than you guys are even and 
I'd been working so hard um, and in the run-ups of the home Olympic Games, you know, kind of overreaching a lot, even though my training partners might have been fine with the load, but it was a little bit too much load for me. And actually, it was part of the reason that led me to get mono, uh, but led me to the overtraining fatigue illness, because I was probably just pushing myself too hard too often. Whereas if I'd known that, look, genetically I made this way so... I might just reassure my mind, my my worry, paranoid mind to say, maybe today we don't need to train hard. Uh, maybe we wait till Saturday to train hard, for example. So it's just about tailoring your week schedule with this extra piece of information in mind. It shouldn't change your entire planning, but it should be added into the panel of what you know you can handle versus uh, you know your genetics as well. This seems very tied into the antioxidant need because on according to your guys' measurements, me and Jake both have raised antioxidant need. And, of course, uh, if our listeners don't know, antioxidants reduce inflammation. So to me, there's sort of like an inverse proportion between the fact that we are medium speed recovers and we also have a raised antioxidant need. It makes it makes sense to me. Is That's there, a, yeah, it, yeah. Two of the genes in this panel uh, are also used to calculate the antioxidant need, but there is an extra gene in the antioxidant need in particular called the GPX1 gene, um, which isn't in the recovery speed panel. It's never been shown to be related to recovery um, in particular. So yeah, the SOD2 gene, for example, is in the injury risk in the recovery speed panel. Um, and that's the sodium dismutase 2 gene, if you want to know its full name. And uh, and that does link. So there are some overlaps between um, genes and their research. Uh, and then there are some genes which, of course, don't overlap whatsoever. But that does make sense, of course. If you have an impaired ability to neutralize free radicals to deal with oxidative stress, then, of course, you're going to need longer to recover after causing that oxidative stress. So, yeah, there is some overlap there, and it's very interesting to, to see how that fits in. Um, one thing is, I imagine most people, when they think of an Olympic athlete, that, um, you know, when they think about their genetics, it is going to be just the the height, the, the perfect genetics, like everything's going to be off Superhero. the charts. Superhero. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and when hearing you talk about some of these things, um, you know, when you're saying that you are a very slow um recoverer um so what is a i mean how do you think that is all factored in like to your own performance and are there certain parts about your genetic profile that you think have been very beneficial and and helped set you apart and you know make you uh an olympic athlete i mean of course there's a strong um you know a big part of it is your training and your uh, lifestyle and whatnot but what, what about your genetics do you think contributed to you being the athlete that you are well, this is a really interesting question, guys, and probably like a whole other debate on the nurture versus nature uh, thing. But one of the big realizations for me as an athlete, and this is what changed me from being a good national level athlete to an Olympic athlete, was the realization that I could make up for any perceived lack of natural talent that I had with better targeted work. So, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Michael Johnson, who's the world record holder in the 400 meters. Of, uh, of course, American, may yeah, have heard of, of him. So, and was the world record in the 200 meters until Usain Bolt came along. But um, they, he, he wrote a book once called Slaying the Dragon. Within this book, he had this equation that he'd written, which was, um, it was talent plus opportunity divided by hard work equals success. And what he meant from that was that you may have a certain, let's say you rank yourself as, oh, I'm six out of 10 on natural talent. Um, uh, the opportunity in the developed world is pretty much 10 out of 10. We get the, we can buy a pair of shoes, we can buy a pair of track cleats, for example, or, and uh, we can play the sport we want to play uh, or pursue the fitness goal we want to pursue. Um, and then whatever we perceive we may lack in that natural talent score can be made up for with hard work so it's that's the that's the question of genetics versus environment so for me when i reached the beijing olympic games and in this olympic village you sit there with you know however many thousand other tens of thousands other athletes from around the world who do so many different sports from so many different cultures and there's so many body types that you realize actually there's no one correct body type there's no one correct genetics actually we're all here and we're all different and a lot of people are what we would call just pretty normal looking you know so like i'm not i'm not some 
physical specimen. I promise you guys. You know, I, like I'm I'm just your average guy on the street. But I did the right kind of training for me. It so happens from when I was young. So my environment suited me, um, and my desire suited me. And then then there's the question of mental ability too. And that that's something we're not measuring on the genetics here. So what I think is really important is that if anyone perceives that they perhaps oh I'm not as naturally gifted as somebody else. If you get the environment right, you can make up for any lack of that natural gift. There's no uh, barrier to entry for this thing. Yeah, we, we've seen that. So, for example, you could have a child in rural China, and he might have the best genetics for 100 meter running in the world. But if he's not got a track, and he doesn't know that the 100 meters is a competitive event that you can run in, he doesn't care about track and field, then he's not going to beat Usain Bolt. Right. So, but if you have a guy with less better, less genetics, uh, um, sort of, let's say, lesser suited genetics for the hundred meters than this child in rural China, but he grows up in Jamaica where their national sport is the hundred meter sprint, then he's going to be pretty much more successful than the kid with the better genetics but no environment. Yeah. So oh. it's just how you manipulate the environment. That's 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 the real important part. But you can't manipulate the environment in a targeted way without knowing what the genetics say right and all that makes good sense it's interesting the crossfit world as we've seen um significantly increased participation um especially at the sort of competitive level over the past few years is i feel like we have a lot of people whose um their uh i guess their talent uh no i was gonna say their i guess their opportunity is uh trying to think how to put it best but they uh everyone's working hard they're working intelligently and they have the opportunity to train quite a bit um they're you know close to professional level athletes and then yeah. I'm, i feel like what we're seeing it to some extent the the shake out there is um you know is the genetics you know we're seeing the the bubble athletes the people who are very good but not quite great are probably training in a very similar volume and fashion as uh, the people towards the top of the pack. Rather than training for, you know, something that would suit their ability. Is that's not what you're saying, Jake? Not quite. But I'm just saying everything else equal, um, their, their training, you their lifestyle. You think the genetics are separating them? I feel like they're, you know, we are seeing people with very similar, like if we're looking at that, that equation, everything I feel like is similar for these people. Um, very, or very close, other than the genetics. I mean, I, I have to assume that... Um, there's other people training as much as Rich Froning. Um, yeah, that, that, that's right. You know, like everyone has the opportunity that's taken care of because you can join the gym. Um, and then everyone probably, you guys probably work them pretty hard. So they all have the hard, hard work element. Uh, so it's just the, the other element, which so far we've been blind to, is the genetic element. So we're just helping people trying to understand that. So you have the full picture. Very cool. Yeah, I, we don't want to take too much of your time. I think that's a great spot to uh, leave it off. If people want to find you, Andrew, and DNA Fit, where can they go? Oh, yeah, so, of course, we're just on dnafit.com. Um, I want to make sure, you know, so you guys are, are excited. If anyone's interested, um, we, you know, we're happy. We are actually extending a, a discount on this panel of, of the test to your listeners. So um, if you – this the – the test that you guys have got, which is all the fitness markers and all the diet markers, um, is called the Fitness Diet Pro. Um, so if anyone's interested, test. yeah, if anyone's interested, just head to dnafit.com and enter the code um, dnafitrva, okay. uh, and they can get a, a 30% discount on the Fitness Diet Pro, uh, which um, which brings it uh, you know, a good a good chunk off the off the price there. So we, I think it retails in the US. You have always testing my currency conversion skills here, but I think um, I think we do it at around $400. So it's like 30% off the the 400. So it's a pretty decent chunk. Um, so if you guys are interested, um, you know, head there, and of course, uh, anyone can ask me any questions as well on Twitter. I'm just at Andrew Steele um, with an E on the end of Steele, so I'll be around uh, as well. Anyone has any queries, just find me on social media. I don't think our people know what queries are. <laughs> okay, questions. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, definitely, we will distribute the uh, the discount code, and um, you know, I'm sure we appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure our listeners do as well. Yeah, thanks for talking with us, Andrew. 
No worries, guys. I look forward to you um, using your, your your genetics from now on and making sure you you uh, you can maybe maybe one of you can look to improve your VO two max and see how see maybe, if you get the maybe I won't score. maybe I won't blow my ligaments out. <laughs> Don't blow your ligaments out. out. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. Great stuff. Okay. Thanks, guys. Great. All right, guys. Until next week, it's just exercise.